Welcome back to Media Apocalypse, our series about the threats facing journalism, news gathering, and the flow of information in our democracy. Now, our show is dedicated to exploring legal, technological, and practical solutions for preserving the press function. Our guest this week is Professor, uh, professor Jasmine McNeely, who is Associate Professor in the Department of Telecommunications at the University of Florida and Associate Director of the Marion B. Breckner First Amendment Project. Hello, Jasmine. It's great to have you with us. Thank you. Um, so today I wanted to ask about your research, especially two issues. One is how social media and the algorithms that social media relies on are affecting racial equality in the United States. And the second question is gonna be about the same issue, but I really wanna drill down on the question of surveillance and data collection. But first, let's talk about social media and algorithms. This is things like how, how are people persuaded? How does propaganda work? How is disinformation spread? What have you been working on and what issues do you think are really the most important? Absolutely. Um, thanks for the question. I think the issues that are really important um, go into probably what we all think about when we think about free expression and the press. And it's an issue that's been around for a long time. And that is, what's the definition of what's newsworthy and what's in the public interest? So um, one thing I've been considering over and over again is when we have algorithms that um, surface certain materials, um, so certain tweets come up first, or you may have missed, or um, your Facebook feed is algorithmically driven versus uh, timeline driven or chronological. It's basically an algorithm stating, this is something you should be looking at. But what does that mean then for how we define what's newsworthy or in the public interest? And what does it mean then when certain things are being surfaced by the algorithm when they're popular but not necessarily truthful, right? So if an account on Twitter or whatever social media um, site is, is popular, but it's popular for all the wrong reasons, then you're going to get a lot more uh, eyeballs on that, uh, that message or that information simply by dint of it being popular and the algorithm looking at, oh, this is a very popular account and or message, so let's make it even more popular, right? So I think with respect to racial divisions then, um, in this uh, continuing era, not new era, but continuing era of, of racist, um, inequitable, um, divisive, uh, rhetoric. Um, we have counts using tools that amplify um, these messages. I think what's servicing more and more are these racist, sexist, homophobic, whatever um, messages. And again, we have to go back to what are we going to say to these um, organizations with regard to how they're defining newsworthiness or public interest with respect to their algorithms. And nobody has well, I don't think anyone has really confronted that issue of how are these, what are basically media organizations now defining what's in public interest, what's, what's newsworthy with respect to what they're surfacing or making more popular online. Good. Let me drill down a little bit further about this. As you know, Twitter and Facebook both uh, have uh, hate speech policies mm -hmm. and they direct their moderators to take down hate speech. But I take it the point you're making is that even the existence of these hate speech policies and even the existence of armies of moderators organized around the world is not very effective. Why do you think it's not very effective? Well, you know, a couple of reasons it's not very effective. One is, so there, there are armies of moderators around the world, but every country, even region, has its own idea about what's hate speech and what's, what's hateful. And it's particularly useful to be within a certain context or to know, be, be fluent or culturally competent in, in certain areas to be able to moderate in that area. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one. 
Uh, another reason is um, while there are people, there are humans in the loop, you're just talking about the, the people moderators, um, many of these sites still use algorithmic moderation, right? Um, and so people come after the algorithm. Um, and even for the timeline itself, or the wh whatever is amplified first, it is amplified first, then moderated. So it's already out there, then comes the takedown, then comes the, you need to delete your tweet. So the message is already sent. So even if you take it down afterwards, damage done. Right, and, and I take it that the, the problem is, is that there is a kind of conflict of interest between the policy of moderation and the business model of the algorithm. I, I would definitely agree with that. Um, these sites exist to transfer data, to collect data, certainly, but to transfer data, to share, um, to be communications entities or organizations. That's the whole point that for their whole point for existence is these sharing or networking or connecting. And so how does the data collection, so could you explain to the audience how the, the business model of data collection, uh, which uh, prioritizes engagement in order to collect more data, sure. has the effect of being at cross purposes with an ass asserted claim that the social media company is not interested in the propagation of divisive, racially divisive or racist speech? Mm -hmm. um, so data allows organizations to make inferences about people using their product and, and people not using their product, quite frankly. So um, any kind of message, hateful message or positive, happy, fun messages, give them data. It gives them data about who's interacting with it, how they interact with it, the amount of time you spend interacting with it, all of this for um, them to make more kinds of decisions uh, related to things like what kind of ads they show you or what kind of other content they're showing you or make predictions about you as an individual or community. So with respect to um, the kind of hate or, or racially divisive uh, messages and data collection, um, we know that particular um, particularly the large social media organizations understand that some of these messages are really terrible and horrible. At the same time, they are very popular among certain groups of people. Well, I mean, I would, I would say they don't have to be popular as long as they're engaging. So in other words, right. some people like them, some right. people just hate them, right. but they can't take their eyes away from them once they right. see them. And, and, and you're, you're correct, uh, Jack, and perhaps I should use their in, the engaging versus popular because even, even the hate watching or the hate scrolling that people do gives more data, which is a part of the business model of many of these sites. So um, it's not necessarily within the best interest um, of many organizations to stop certain kind of content, even if it is hateful or could lead to violence or could lead to harm in some kind of way because there is stuff on the back end that is valuable to that organization. So the question is, uh, Facebook in particular, but also Twitter are getting terrible press over uh, these kinds of messages, over the violence that's spawned by them. Mm -hmm. And they're getting pummeled uh, in the media and they're getting pummeled, they're dragged before congressional hearings and such. Why do you think that the, uh, the bad publicity and uh, the enormous public pressure is not affecting their business model? Yeah, so I think there's a couple of reasons. One, sometimes for certain people, they're the only game in town with respect to connecting. So Facebook um, is the internet for certain communities and certain people. It is how their communities um, communicate with each other. It's ubiquitous for a huge amount of people around the world, right? So Facebook has a captured audience because if you want to connect with other people, you will use that tool because there's not a whole lot else there. But also just from a, like a, a analog, like media studies kind of a thought mm -hmm. process, um, even bad press is good press. Um, people will look at it, they will hate scroll, they will hate follow, they will hate join, 
just to see the train wreck that is happening on these platforms. Also, many people will complain about Twitter or complain about Facebook, but they'll still remain a part of those platforms. One, again, because a lot of people they know are on there, that's how they connect, right. but also because that's some of the fastest way to get news is through Twitter. You want right. a breaking story? You want to know about a breaking thing? Go on Twitter, and that's way faster even than many of the news outlets. Right. So in other words, th there are the problems of network effects, but it's also, your point is, they're the constitution. They constitute the public sphere. The digital yeah. public sphere is constituted by these platforms. Well, they're definitely a huge part of it, yes. Yeah. So I want to talk about solutions, but before we talk about solutions, I think you really can't talk about the problem of algorithms and their effect on the public sphere without talking about the second thing you mentioned, which is the question of data collection and surveillance. So as you understand, and it's not just simply social media, it's so many other things. Yes. How do you think about the way in which what Shoshana, uh, Shoshana Zuboff now calls uh, surveillance capitalism, the basic business model of the collection and monetization of data is affecting uh, racial equality in the United States and racial justice? Mm -hmm. um, so, as I mentioned earlier, data provides kind of the fuel for organizations of all kinds. So not just that we're talking about Facebook and kind of corporate organizations, but governments as well, and, and civil society organizations to make decisions about people and communities. Um, the problem is that these tools are not in a vacuum that they exist and were created within the context of social issues that we've had for a very long time. Racism is not new. Uh, technology amplifies racism. Sexism is not new. Technology helps to amplify these. So when technology is created within a context that is both you know, racist, sexist, you name it, they're going to have those aspects embedded in the technology. This is the, the bottom line. Technology is not neutral. And so when you have this huge scheme of data collection, and the data that is collected, let's just say, is about uh, um, who should the bank give a loan to. If you've had a system where um, the overwhelming amount of loans were given to white people versus people of color, and that is the data upon which you train your new technology, your algorithm, guess what? Your algorithm is going to be trained to think like that data. Mm -hmm. And so you're just perpetuating systems of inequality, inequity in these, um, it, you know, using technology based on the analog kind of social issues we have. Right. Um, so thinking about that, how, how traditionally many communities and groups of people have been disparately negatively impacted um, and that is found in the data, why would we continue to use that data to train technology that would then make similar kinds of decisions about us and, and amplify, again, those um, inequitable and disparate negative impacts? One issue that flows out of that is where the data is coming from. So some of the data, I take it, is, is, comes from uh, ordinary commercial interactions. Some of it actually comes from social media companies. Social media. And, and data brokers, I take it, play a very important part in the story you're telling because they're the sort of conduits that take data from one type of business or entity into another and, put, and create a market for it. Mm -hmm. I, I, I definitely agree with that. So our huge data brokers like Axiom, but also um, some of the data brokers we don't suspect as data brokers. So anytime social media collects data, they sometimes will license the use of that data. They will sometimes make it available to other organizations. But I also want to make sure we also include in this governments. Governments have there's a huge amount of data. Um, there are also connections with government and corporate entities with respect to data and kinds of data. So I think it's important to think about um, there are a whole lot of structures or institutions that have data or that transfer data or make data available that is then used for these systems. Now, of course, this is a series on the media and the public sphere. Sure. It's really important to, uh, to discuss the stuff you were just talking about the last five minutes. The reason why is when we talk about data surveillance and data use, 
it's not like there's a media part and then there's all the other part. It's all combined together. Right. So it, when we think about solutions, we have to understand that any solutions that are concerned with data collection are going to have ripple effects in other parts of society. And what happens in other parts of society is going to have ripple effects on the social media. So have you started to think about the right way to offer solutions for the problems of um, the work that social media and algorithms are doing uh, in the United States? Uh, yeah, so I, I, one of the things I've continued to think about is one, what it is that we mean when we say data. Um, so as a, a, a mass comm scholar, I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about how language matters and how language constructs how we think about things, which then goes into our laws, our regulations, our policies, right? So we just think of data as some like abstract thing that is so far removed from the human. Um, we miss the harm, the very real harm that can come from this piece of something or this connected entity. Instead, I, I, I ask people to really consider what it is we think about when we think about data. And I say that instead of saying our data or his data or her data or their data, that we think about saying us, mm -hmm. right? Representations of us. And so when we, can, when we put the human back there, there's a lot more duty necessary to a human, or should be anyway, there's a lot more duty necessary to a human with respect to harm than there is to some abstract piece of property or fictitious thing that we have over here that we don't really consider harm with. And so if we change how we think about data, then maybe we can get more towards an equitable uh, solution with respect to things like surveillance and data collection without permission. And what it is we think about when we say, oh, this data was public, as if that's a, you know, right. a good rationale one, for doing One thing that. related to that that I wanted to throw at you and see what you think about it. So yes. in, this, in the field of privacy law, which I, I'm in partly, many scholars think that we should move toward an environmental account of data and privacy. The reason why being that whenever I disclose information, I'm not only disclosing information about me, I'm disclosing about information about everyone else who's like me yes. and everyone who's connected to me, everyone who's uh, on my social graph, uh, everyone who's in my family, if it's genetic information, everyone who resembles me, everyone who has the same tastes and preferences I do. So I'm basically, everyone's always informing on everyone else. So the result is not like there's just your data, there's a whole sea of data. And so right. in effect, d the data problem is a, pro is a collective social problem. Now, how Absolutely. does that issue help us understand the problem we face when we think about the way data collection and collation and use is affecting uh, equality. Right, so I think uh, many times when we think of data collection, we think about it as an individual issue, like that individual person could have been harmed, or if there's a data breach and someone wants to sue, it's like, did that individual person receive harm? But we should think about it as a collective issue because this is about many people or many connections that could possibly be touched by this. And then the inferences about communities of people and communities or groups of people. And therefore, there's a much wider impact than just the individual that I think is really important to consider. But also, there is hardly any meaningful way for anybody to protect themselves from the network. If I'm connected to you, I'm connected to Sandra, I'm connected to Ronell, I'm connected to whoever, and something happens to me, and then there's a possibility, very real possibility that all of you are going to be impacted by that as well. But you had no opportunity to protect yourself whatsoever. Right. And that must be considered. So the, this leads me to ask a very basic question about solutions, and then I'm going to hand it over to Ronell. But as you've been thinking about these issues, is there any way, a plausible way to cause social media to either internalize the costs they're imposing on everyone else in society or to adopt a, a public interest attitude uh, with respect to the people they serve, that is the communities they serve. Uh, what, what kinds of policy solutions have you been thinking about? Um, yeah, so I, I think some of the policy um, 
solutions I've been thinking about is number one, there should be like a blanket <laughs> prohibition on data collection uh, in general. And I think um, Senator Brown, Senator Sherrod Brown's proposed data act kind of moved towards, moves us towards this. Um, in that 80 page proposal, he mentions consent never. And mm -hmm. I think that's a really important um, move because uh, many organizations and governments as well will say like, okay, if we get consent, but this is not about consent. This is about like the possible harms that could happen and consent does not really get to um, what could possibly happen to someone and how people have been interpret interpreting consent has been way too broad and yeah. way too powerful for people to, again, meaningfully protect themselves. But also we know that people will consent to things yeah. willy nilly, they well, don't have it, time, it, it, they don't read privacy yeah. policies. If it's an environmental model, consent is irrelevant. Since right. when I, so I don't get any choice about when you share data. Your data affects me, but I have no say in that. So right. my consent is not really relevant. So what you're imagining then is that there might be restrictions on collection, data yes. collection in the front end. I call the front end of the data. What other things have you been thinking about? Um, so besides restrictions on data at the front end, I've been thinking about uh, how <laughs> Some perhaps business models may need to change or be abolished. So if your business model is that you make a lot of money based on uh, collecting this vast amount of data of all kinds, even data that you don't know what you're gonna do with, but you have it there just in case, what if you were restricted to only what you absolutely needed? Right. What if, um, it was just like name, um, possible age range, and you know maybe location. Well, this what about would, this would yes. affect data brokers because what it means to be a data broker is to collect lots of stuff you don't need. Yes. Right. So that that means then certain kinds of businesses, certain kinds of business models would have to stop, and I think that could possibly reshape this data landscape. Yeah. But also then we have to think about what do we do with the masses of data that's already collected. Right. And there are movements like Data for Black Lives that says abolish big data. I'm certainly a proponent of that because it's just this mass dossier of information on, on individuals and communities that for the most part has not been tracking all that well with the impacts that it's having on specific communities that are already vulnerable or marginalized. I'm thinking racially, gender, but also chronic health uh, issues or health issues in general, other kinds of specific things that make people uh, really vulnerable to inferences. Thank you. Grinnell? Hi, Jasmine. Thank you so much for being here. This is um, really helpful and I think a really important component of um, some of the broader questions that we've been trying to ask and answer in this group. Uh, you uh, contributed to a recently uh, released uh, UN special report to the Human Rights Council uh, on contemporary forms of racism, racial discrimination, and xenophobia. Uh, and um, I want to ask you a couple of questions about the essay that you contributed to that report, um, which yes. you titled Amplifying Otherness. Um, and I, uh, and I want to tie it into some things that you were just describing about uh, this sort of wider uh, human rights framework here rather than this sort of individual rights framework. Uh, thinking about uh, broad based hu um, human, the hu broad based human rights approach uh, to tackling some of these problems. Okay. Um, your essay says uh, that, uh, that we should sort of be thinking about uh, the creation and use and deployment of technology, particularly for our purposes, sort of communications technology, without regard to the uh, disparate impacts that you say it might have on communities um, that are different than the imagined audience. I'm wondering if, uh, just for starters, you can sort of describe to us um, what you mean by this principle of amplifying otherness, um, and then maybe tie it in for us uh, to this sort of broader human rights framework. That is, um, we've explored lots of uh, sort of solutions and frameworks in which to think about some of the problems 
um, and particularly problems of news distribution. But why is human, uh, the human rights framework a framework that has to be engaged on this front when we're thinking about the flow of information on matters of public concern to various communities? Yeah, so um, Amplifying Otherness, I had read a, an essay um, from out of Berkeley and it was talking about otherness or othering, and which is a, a kind of common term that basically makes it uh, as though these people, whether an individual or a group of people, um, are different and therefore um, not as important, can be ignored, neglected, whatever the case may be. Um, when something is other, it is not deserving of the same level of care that you would give those who are in group. And so I think that's really important, right? So we talk about imagined audience for a product or service or a thing, then that in group is the ones you're trying to attract or solve a problem for, not really caring about those other folks or the possible impacts on them. And so when I think about technological othering, I'm thinking about how we create these tools, whether they're communication tools or other kinds of tools, and we don't really consider those others that are not the direct or supposed direct audience for that tool, whether it's problem solving or just a money making tool. And then later we have to deal with, or at least we want people to deal with the impacts on that group, or we're surprised that this group is impacted by this technology or, or communications media or scheme. And I think on the front end, if we are, even at the ideation stage, and not even at the ideation stage, but exactly at the ideation stage, if we look beyond just that in-group, we have a chance, an opportunity to stop with these uh, negative disparate impacts or the harms that come to the people we consider the other, the outside. Uh, of the imagined audience. That's really helpful. Um, your essay focuses on sort of the broader tech sphere, sort of data collection in uh, broader communications technology. Uh, but do you think that this, uh, this pattern holds true, this amplifying otherness pattern holds true more specifically within the subsphere that we've been um, investigating in our conversations, that is um, uh, the flow of news, uh, right, the gathering of news, the distribution of information on matters of public concern. Are there reasons for us to believe um, that, particularly in this um, new media landscape, that uh, otherness continues to be amplified there? And what, uh, uh, in what ways do we need to think uniquely about that subcategory of, um, of amplification? Yeah, so I think in considering the press um, in the United States, there's a long history of the press, one, not representing the communities that they're covering um, and having no cultural competence in those communities, even the language that is used. Uh, I'm thinking, referring again to, to Mike Brown and the huge issue when uh, the newspaper used the, he was no angel. Like, what are the ramifications of using that kind of language and what, what kinds of stereotypes does it edify then again? So we have that, right? Not being representative of the communities that they're covering, um, what, what is considered lacking in cultural competence with coverage, um, even things like online, uh, you, you know, posting of the uh, uh, mugshot, and the mugshot galleries, right? And the, the harms that happen with respect to those because of our criminal justice system and our historic um, racism in those, those areas. Um, the press is no different than any other institution in the United States with respect to the biases um, that happen. Again, with the advent of the use of technological tools, if those biases, those prejudices, racism, sexism, homophobia haven't been taken care of or at least addressed, then those tools only um, help to continue those uh, negative social ills, but also amplify the harm that comes with those ills. Thanks, that's helpful. I, um, I have one more uh, sort of a question to sort of burrow down into um, 
this work on amplifying otherness, and then I'll, I'll hand it over uh, to Sandy. Um, your essay describes, uh, sort of proposes that we have to tackle this problem from a couple of different vantage points because the amplification of othering um, is happening in different ways. And uh, you describe how it's happening um, through neglect and how it's happening through exclusion and how it's happening through disinformation. And you've talked a little bit uh, with Jack about the disinformation front, but I wonder if you could give us some sort of concrete examples of what you mean uh, by neglect uh, creating this amplification of otherness and what you mean by exclusion creating this uh, amplification. Uh, do you want just with respect to communications technology? Or what? Yeah, sure. I mean, we would love um, <laughs> the, the sort of press specific examples would be fantastic, but um, more globally, just to help us think about the ways in which um, the ways in which uh, in, uh, it seems like there's an intense spectrum there, right? I think that's really interesting that you're tapping into this notion that sometimes it's happening maybe, uh, I mean, I read into this and you can tell me if this is right or not, that sometimes this is happening purposefully, right? We choose maybe for business reasons or for, um, uh, uh, I, I don't know the reasons, I'd like you to articulate them for us, for certain sets of reasons, um, choosing to exclude um, certain audiences from participation in the uh, wider communicative uh, framework. Uh, but also um, uh, bare neglect um, you describe as bringing about some of those same consequences. And I'm just wondering if you can sort of like give us something to chew on that describes sort of what that would look like in the real world. Um, examples of um, amplification of otherness through neglect and examples of amplification of otherness through um, a del more deliberate exclusion so that we could think more creatively about what the solutions look like. Sure. So I would say a, an example, um, if we go on Twitter, um, a lot of journalists are on Twitter. Uh, a lot of news organizations are on Twitter because it's, it's Twitter, right? It's a place to distribute information rather quickly, but also to engage with audiences or, or prospective audience members. Um, but there have been studies that have been done about uh, journalists' engagement on Twitter and the kinds of audiences that they engage with. And uh, last week, I believe someone came out with a study that they'd done and looked at who do journalists, particularly journalists at major, um, major news organizations, who do they retweet? Who do they cite to? Like which of their colleagues they, just, they cite to? And basically how do they interact? And I, I think you can imagine what the numbers were with respect to um, engagement with, so male, white male journalist engagement with uh, and retweeting or amplifying news from their um, female colleagues or those who identify as women, but also those who identified as people of color. They were disparate in comparison to their retweets of um, white male, right? So that's like an interesting finding, like how a um, social issue, which is engagement with people who are not like you, can then be amplified. Because we know that a, Twitter is a place where people get information. But if information is going through these super uh, spreaders, so to speak, of these uh, white men who are at kind of elite news organizations within the United States that have a large audience, what does it mean then when certain people are shut out of that network or less likely to be in that network? And what kinds of stories will people miss or not have access to? And stories about who will they not have access to? So I think that's a, that's a real kind of significant thing. Um, less pressy, but still kind of political or public interest engagement. I think the past, what, two or three years now, the, um, and only re recently kind of closed, the Sidewalk Labs uh, debacle in, in Toronto, where you had the community was ignored on the front end with respect to whether or not they want a, um, organization connected to Google, a larger organization that people have a lot of reservations about. And I think reservations is probably a mild way to, way to put it, right? So people were really concerned about you're letting basically Google come in and one, run a portion of the city, but you haven't really conversed with, you haven't 
had any kind of participatory scheme with respect to whether people who will be using this neighborhood, who live in this neighborhood, who will walk through it, are concerned about the level of data collection that was just gonna happen as a smart city or a smart segment of the city and how that played out um, with, with protesting and, and uh, large scale use of social media to amplify the message, right? Uh, by activists and members of the community. So I think that's a concrete example of just neglect. Some of that purposeful, right? I, I bet at the front end, if the city had asked many of those people, they would have been told no from the, the very beginning. But, you know, it's rather better, better to ask, you know, for uh, forgiveness than to ask for permission for some, time, for some things. And, and they tried it and it, it failed because they were such a, an outcry. So I think that's an example of um, just not, you know, neglect, but also ignoring the rights and, and, uh, and the, uh, the wants of, of segments of the community. Thank you. Sandy? Nice to meet you, Jack. Nice to meet you. It's been a really interesting conversation so far. Um, I, I find myself focused, because of my background as a media lawyer, um, very closely on the press and on journalism and on the, the concerns that we've been looking into or we've been researching and talking to researchers about, about the diminishment of genuine journalism and particularly at the local scale. Um, and that's as true for, if not more true for minority communities um, as it is for, you know, the general white community um, with possibly the exception of the business community, um, which seems to thrive regardless. But I'm interested in whether or not as you look at algorithms, and AI, and, and, and with that, I would also throw in data collection. You see any serious implications for the press or from the press, either pro, that is, it will, there are ways this could enhance news coverage, or there are ways where the press has used these tools in negative postures. Sort of the yin and yang of how do, is journalism either going to be enhanced by AI, secondarily by data collection, not that they're necessarily disconnected, um, or are they among some of the, the protagonists, if you will, in your story? Yeah. So I think um, none of these organizations, whether they're press or other kinds of media or technology organizations are free of the possibilities uh, that how they use technology can be uh, possibly harmful or um, neglectful or ignorant. Um, and uh, and I think of on the press side, an example could be, so uh, on news sites, there is a b testing of things like headlines like how do we attract people to um certain stories how do we get more engagement and uh, it's based on like how do we let's test what kinds of buzzwords and framing attracts people right and attracts certain kinds of people because there's analytics running in the back about location and and where they come from like how do they get to the site and you know, the possible inferences you can make on that. So I think that is uh, you know, a kind of situation where you could be um, amplifying certain ideas, even in the headline, um, how you frame the headline, what the story is about. Um, and you see a lot of controversy about that on places like Twitter, like you guys know this is just a clickbait headline the story is not even about that, or they didn't even say that, or you've done this wrong. So I think that there's that possibility. Um, I also think that um, some news organizations, not the huge ones, but um, some other news organizations have the opportunity to um, make headway, so to speak, if they, um, 
can find a way to attract engagement using maybe um, algorithms. I don't know how they're going to do that. Um, but if a smaller news organization, a community news organization can find a way to have their um, stories surface for, say, people who are geolocated within their region, it may be more helpful for that uh, community to hear from a uh, news organization working in that community than for them to hear from the national news or the larger news organizations. I'm thinking, for example, like Chicago has several smaller news organizations, right? But they certainly don't get the same amount of perhaps engagement or uh, connections to news or to news uh, readers as say the New York Times or the Washington Post or the Wall Street Journal, just because those are larger and they attract more yeah. attention. But could the reader possibly surface for people geolocated? I think so. Um, that could be a helpful thing that a, 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 a tech organization does. You, you, you've, if a person has um, allowed their lo location data to be collected, then maybe connect them to news in that place. So if I'm in Florida, I may get New York Times you know, headlines when they just give me whatever they think I should be looking at. But I also maybe should be getting um, what the Jacksonville paper said, or what the Miami Herald said, or what the Tampa Tribune said, because I'm, you know, allowed my location to be to be uh, shared with that organization. These sound, I mean, the latter at least sound actually fairly positive. Um, you've done research, I know, on how policymakers can better create policy for data collection, uh, more consumer-centric, if you will, privacy regulation based on data. Um, news organizations, journalists use data in a number of ways, as you no doubt know. Um, I, I, I mean, the A-B testing is one I must say I've completely forgotten about, so thank you very much. And the Twitter research is also interesting. Um, Many rely on it, serving up advertising, of course, and they use it for news gathering quite candidly, as you, again, I'm sure are well aware. Um, would you see the press as being an institution or a series of institutions that you would want to see engaged in the development of data regulation policies? I think the press or news organizations have a role to play. I think one of their major roles is getting information to people. I still don't think there's a critical mass of people who know actually what is happening with respect to when they engage online, when they go online, not even online, when they, when they walk about in a city now, when their phone connects to Wi-Fi it, in you know, the coffee shop or quite frankly, walking down the street when there's you know, hot spots. I don't, I don't think there's a critical mass of of people who understand what's happening. And that's not to say that it's on them, it's just that there's so much happening with respect to data collection. So I think a, a critical role the press has, and that's their traditional role, and that is how do we teach people? How do we digest this for people and then get this information to them? Um, I think that's a, that, that's a critical role right there. I also think a critical role is questioning our legislators. Like, what, what is the deal, you all? It's been such a long time and you still have no federal uh, privacy or data security law passed here. Um, what's the problem? Why isn't this a bigger deal for you all? Why aren't you doing something? Um, but also uh, continuing to investigate the organizations, corporate, civil society, and government organizations who are in the business of data collection themselves and use. Um, so I think there are those like traditional roles um, that the press can still play and should still be playing with respect to data protection and, and anti-surveillance. You were kind enough not to uh, point the finger at the greedy nature that journalists have for da data at all levels and at all times and how um, my, my, my various clients and 
colleagues over the years have been in the forefront of fighting for more data, not less. Um, and I think that's a real tension in, in thinking about, for the press to think about data privacy and perhaps, although I don't know this for a fact, even reporting on it. Um, and just one last quick thing that you may not have given any particular attention to, you talk to people who are looking at European models, and I didn't know whether any of them have struck you as being, if not the answer, and now I'm thinking of Facebook and some of the others, not, not and their data collection and their data use, um, and disinformation. Um, whether any of them seem to have any promise, something that you would want to see pulled into our thinking? Yeah, so I think um, legislation like the GDPR is a good step towards um, stopping some behaviors or at least controlling it or constraining it. I don't think it's that great. In fact, I don't, I don't think it goes far enough to to stop uh, organizations from data collection and use, right? Um, and uh, what I think it does is it kind of like shifts burdens, which sometimes helps, but it, it's still not an overall, in my opinion, <laughs> an overall omnibus, let's have to, uh, let's, let's stop this behavior because it's harmful kind of legislation. That's the kind of legislation we need, particularly because uh, many of these tech firms find their home in the United States and then spread their harmful tactics all around the world. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Jasmine, thank you for this uh, wonderful discussion. And we're so pleased that you could come on the show with us today. Thank you.